technology that we have going on will work well. We are in this Bible passage today where Paul is writing to Timothy about some difficult things. And I'm going to be honest with you kids, it's going to be kind of a graphic passage because Paul is using this vivid imagery of how sometimes God's people get stuck in a trap. And so I have a few traps to show you, but the first illustration I want to use for, especially for you guys, is I want to ask, what is this right here? What is this? A fishing hook. How many of you enjoy fishing, adults? How many of you enjoy fishing? I really enjoy fishing, and to be honest, I don't get to fish as much as I used to. But one of the dangers of fishing is that from time to time, if you're not careful, you can get a hook stuck in your hand. How many of you have ever experienced this painful? Oh, it's just terrible. And so I was thinking I should actually put a hook in my hand, but I have to play guitar later. So I'm going to use this leather glove and let's pretend I'm out fishing and ow, 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 ow. Look at that hook. It's right in my skin. Now, if you've ever gotten your hook in your hand before, it really, really hurts going in, but it hurts excruciatingly more to get it out because of that bar that's on the hook. But here's the thing, and this is why I want to use it as an illustration. Jackson, can you hold that side for me? If you have this trap, this hook in your hand, and then somebody or something starts pulling it out, 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 out you have to go exactly where that person is pulling you, or that animal, or whatever else in there. And what Paul says is that, look, Timothy, you have to be careful not to get trapped by the stairs of the devil. And it's sort of like, you got to be careful you don't give Satan a foothold. Because if so, then he could pull your life in all different directions. Very painful. But what Paul is saying today is that, look, not only avoid being trapped, but also ask that the Lord would bring you healing so that you could be a worker approved by God where you're not ashamed. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Good job listening, guys. You guys can grab a piece of candy before you return to your seats. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Everyone else, while the kids are getting situated, please open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to finish up chapter 2 today. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here. I don't usually mutilate my skin on a Sunday morning, but I think it's appropriate for this particular passage. As always, we try to look at God's Word from this perspective, is how can we explain what's going on to everyone, including children? So, as we've seen, if you're a guest, we're working through this passage that is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. This person, Timothy, was one of his greatest pupils. His, his, he mentored Timothy. And on his third missionary journey, Paul said to Timothy, you need to stay at the church of Ephesus. This church that I started is under attack. You have these false teachers that are going in and trying to bring division and trying to shipwreck the faith of those people there. And so Timothy stayed there, and as Paul went on his fourth missionary journey, he was arrested for a second time. He's put in a jail in Rome, and right now, as he's writing this letter, he's awaiting execution. His crime? Proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, which was sort of undermining, in the Roman mind, their authority to lead the people. And so here is Paul on death row, in chains, writing this letter to encourage Timothy one more time to be the person that God created him to be. And so as we've seen that there's all this good information, not just for Timothy, but also this letter would be read aloud in the church of Ephesus, and it was read aloud in other churches that have lead us all the way up to today. But I'm going to be honest with you, this is a hard passage to work through. It was painful to write it, because when you understand the imagery here, it just you cringe because it's so very graphic. But as we saw with the kids that there's these times where we go into areas of our life that we shouldn't be and we participate in conversations or we go to places that we know the Lord doesn't want us and we give Satan a foothold into our life. And because of that, we step on this trap and we're then pulled in different directions. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is you need to be on guard. You need to remind people of what they're supposed to do so that all of you can be workers approved by God where there's nothing in your life to be ashamed of. So keep that in mind as we take a look at verse 14. Where Paul writes to Timothy in the church, look, you've got to keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and it only ruins those who listen. 
Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philidius, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some are more noble purposes, and some are ignoble. Now, if a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee from the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with those foolish and stupid arguments, because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant, he must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Now those who oppose them must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And then they will come to their senses and escape the trap or the snare of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. We live in this world where people think, well, because we have science and we're this enlightened people, you know, the spiritual things, that's, that's just... Foolish. All religions, that's just old-fashioned foolishness. Why would you even go to church? One of the reasons that church attendance in North America is down is this idea that there really is no spiritual reality. It's just physical. Paul reminds us that even at this very moment, angels are real, even if we can't see them. Demons are real, even if we can't see them. And yes, there is such a person as the devil who wants nothing more than to distract God's people from understanding their need for Jesus. And so in this very graphic passage, we see these illustration after illustration where God wants us to be this kind of person, and yet Timothy and Paul and even us today were surrounded by this other sort of person. And because we forget, because we need to be reminded, Paul commands Timothy and the church to keep reminding these folks of the good things of the Lord. Warn them before the Lord against quarreling about words. It's of no value. Have you ever been part of a conversation where you're sitting there and someone starts talking and it just makes you feel uncomfortable? Like, in your belly you almost have like butterflies because you're just like, this is not a conversation we should be having. Maybe it's slandering another person. Maybe it's gossiping another person. Maybe it's, it's sort of verbal bullying. And you just sit there and you're like, ah. What do you do? Well, Paul's saying here, don't be part of those things. It ruins those who listen. Do yourself instead to be approved. One approved by God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And so this idea of workman, sometimes when people use this word, they think, well, Paul's only referring to pastors. Only pastors need to do this sort of thing. Or elders, or teachers, or missionaries. That's not the word that Paul uses there. He uses the Greek word for a laborer, an agricultural field hand. So clearly all people that call themselves Christians need to not take part in these foolish discussions. He said, no, you're not ashamed. Why? Because you correctly handle the word of truth. When I was growing up, our version of Kids Club was called a WANA. And it, was, uh, it stood for approved workmen are not ashamed. And one of the things in my Iwana club as a kid was we memorized scripture. That's why in our kids' club, especially this year, we've made an emphasis to remind our kids of the value of learning scripture so that they too, as they grow up and they're formed for ministry, whatever God has in store for them, they're not ashamed because they know what God has called us to do and they can correctly handle the word of truth. And then Paul says again, don't be those people who have godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Again, maybe you've been there and people are, are, are using profanity, right? And if you've ever been part of a group where somebody starts using profanity, what's really sad is that everybody kind of gets permission to start and it just goes down, 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 and pretty soon you're in the gutter. Paul's saying, no, 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 you can't do these things. Don't be part of these conversations. Because those folks, their teaching will spread like gangrene, like an infection. And here Paul calls out two people. 
Hymenius and Philetius. First one we've talked about before. But imagine if this was being read in the church of Ephesus for the first time. There's friends and family member of these two folks that were asked to leave the church. Not because Paul was being mean, but because they were trying to shipwreck the faith, faith, the faith of the church. They were trying to wreck it in, fall, in false ways, and they were asked to leave. Now, as it, it hard it is for us to understand, the goal of an excommunication, like Paul is pointing out here, is that a person who steps outside of the body of Christ could fully understand what they've done and then apologize, repent, and come back to the church and say, I'm so sorry I was trying to destroy this place. Will you receive me back in? And Paul would say, absolutely. But for these folks here, even if there was friends and family members, they knew what was true and yet they wandered away the truth. And here's one of their false teachings. They say that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, you may see, well, that's not really a big deal, is it? Yeah, it's huge. Because in the ancient world, Greek philosophers believed that the soul was immortal. And yet the body was corrupt. And you could really do with it whatever you want to. Because it's just your body. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. There is two resurrections. There's the spiritual resurrection, which these false teachers, yeah, they agree with that. But there's also going to be a physical resurrection. Where we're all going to get new bodies that aren't broken don't get hurt someday when the Lord comes back. And so apparently what was happening is these false teachers saying, well, no, 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 yeah, there's, the, the, there's this spiritual resurrection, but really you can do whatever you want with your body. It really doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. It's, it's fine. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You can't do those things because they're destroying the faith of some. But nevertheless, again, the compare and contrast. We don't want to be like those folks. We want to have a solid foundation. And then quoting the book of Numbers, the Lord knows who are His. Have you ever been in a setting where you're kind of looking at a person and saying, are they Christian? You really can't tell by looking at a person. If I just look at and say, Christian, Christian, not Christian, Christian, Christian. No, we shouldn't do that. Yet the Lord knows who are His. And how can we anticipate that? Is that everyone who confesses in the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. And we have this all the time where we have people that are walking towards wickedness and we say, Stop! They need to turn away, not just kind of go, that's kind of nice. That's kind of fun. No, when you see that you shouldn't be in a place where you shouldn't be, run far, far away. That's what Paul was trying to remind the church. And then he uses this illustration as a big house, right? The body is often used as a metaphor for the house. But in this house, there are articles. And that word there, that's interesting because he's using the Greek word for like kitchen utensils, like a spoon or a knife. Or a bowl, right? And he says, some of those things in your house or in your body are gold and silver, wood and clay. Some are for good and righteous and noble purposes, but some are for ignoble. And I don't like that word, ignoble. So I looked it up, and this is what Paul is saying. This is getting kind of gross here, but I'm sure you're all mature enough to handle it. How many of you have a dog or cat? Come on, come on. Good. Raise your hand and tell me how many of you have what layman terms would be a pooper scooper. So for a dog, cat, litter box, right? You don't use your hands for that sort of thing, right? Raise your hand and tell me, how many of you would use a pooper scooper to serve someone dinner? No. Nobody, right? You would never use a pooper scooper to serve someone dinner. And yet that's exactly what Paul is saying. That sometimes in our life we accumulate things that are worthless. And he actually uses that phrase for excrement there, used to clean up excrement. So if we have things in our life, right, maybe there's things in your little house that if Jesus walked in and said, hey, this is such a nice house, what is that? Why do you have that in your house? There's often things in our life that just shouldn't be there. Paul says, you need to cleanse yourself of those ignoble things. The stuff that you use for spiritual excrement. You want to be an instrument for noble purposes, made wholly useful to the master to prepare any good work. And then he says, flee from the evil desires of youth. Now this is not true to say that all youth are evil. But we also know that sometimes when we're young and we don't know any better and we're ignorant of things, we do foolish things, right? And so hopefully when we're young and we do those foolish things, we suffer the consequences of those foolishness, and we stop being foolish. And yet I continue to this day, run into people where I'm hearing about their stories like, dude, man, I really miss college, man. College is awesome, man. I can do whatever I want. And I sit there and think, are you kidding me? 
You miss a time where you were foolish and did irresponsible things? Really? That was the best time in your life? Paul's saying, no. Flee from those things. Instead, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord with a pure heart. And for a third time, don't have anything to do with those foolish and stupid arguments. If you're in a situation where something is being talked about that you know you shouldn't be part of, leave the conversation. Just leave. Don't be part of that sort of thing. Because you know that they produce quarrels. They drive division in the church. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. The, the youth group's talking about that today, right? Loving your enemies and how hard that is. If someone's in your face spitting at you, be like, Want a hug? No, I don't advise doing that. I'm saying it's hard when you're getting beat up to be kind to that person. But you need to be gentle. And here it is, in the hope that God will grant them repentance. I have often been in conversations with people where I know that they have junk in their life. I could be the best preacher in the entire country, and there's nothing I could do or say to force a person to repent. Paul points out that it's God that does the turning of the heart. And so when we speak truth and love and kindness to those who are clearly going in the wrong direction, it is that the hope that God will use our words to grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And here Paul says, come to their senses. Literally, he says, so they could sober up. So they could spiritually sober up and understand what they're doing to escape the trap of the devil. And what has the devil done? He's taken them captive to do his will. And so I end with an illustration that, can we see the next slide? One of the um, types of snares that trappers and hunters will use will be a basic snare. So the animal goes through the little snare, they trip the trigger, and then the more that the animal tries to get away, the tighter the snare goes. But we also have one of these dangerous things. This is called a foothold trap, and I'm gonna try really hard not to break a finger. But sometimes in life, we have these traps that lay before us. We have these things that we don't really realize are incredibly dangerous. And yet, all throughout life. Okay, I didn't, I didn't. The world and Satan has placed these traps all over the place. One of the hardest things, so we've been in town serving, we're in on here almost eight years now. The hardest thing in our ministry Bar none, is that we know people, we love people, and we see them walking in a direction that is not of the Lord. We try to stop them saying, hey, don't go that direction. Don't do it. And yet those people are walking closer and closer to the trap of the devil. And it is so painful for us to watch as that person steps directly on the trap. Because what happens to them is once they're in the trap, they're getting pulled in all these different directions. We're saying, stop, no, and they don't even know they've got a foot in this trap. They don't know that they've given Satan a foothold. And so we've got to think back to our illustration of the hook. I hope you were not hoping that I would actually stick the hook in my hand. Some of the kids are like, yeah, do it. No. <laughs> Here's the thing. If you've ever gotten a hook in your skin, you know how painful it is. But sometimes, when you're busy doing other things, you can get a hook in your skin and you don't even know it. Those are the worst because if you don't take care of that hook, it's going to start to get infected. It's going to start to turn gangrene, like we talked about, right? Here's the, the scary thing about all of this. Sometimes, we go into areas and we step on traps that the devil has put in there, and we give Satan a foothold and we don't even know it. So if you'll notice, fishing line is often clear, right? So that the fish don't know that they're trapped, Dave, can you hold that up? Okay. We know people whose lives are hooked by the devil, and yet they're getting pulled in all different areas. So pull me, ah! It doesn't really matter, I'm just pretending. <laughs> pull a bit, ah! We know people who've given Satan a foothold, they're being pulled to do his will, and they don't even know it. It's like they're sitting there with a hook right in their mouth, and you see it, and you're like, don't, 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 and they're getting pulled in all these different areas. So what are we to do when people that we love and care about have given Satan a foothold in their life? So here's the question I'll leave you with. What could be done for a person who has been caught in the traps of this world and the snares of the devil? The first thing we need to do is pray for them. 
We pray and we ask the Lord that they would recognize that their lives, they've given Satan a foothold because they've done and said things and participated in things that are not of the Lord. And then we have to ask the Lord to remove that hook. And just like I tried to illustrate with the kids, man, it, hurt go, it, it hurts going in, but it, see, I can't even get it out. It is so painful coming out. And then as you can imagine, if that was actually in my skin, there's going to be a lot of damage there. There's going to be healing that needs to take place. And so we have to ask the Lord to not only show us where those hooks are, but remove those hooks as painful as it is, and then ask the Lord that would give us healing and clean hands and a clean heart so that we can be the people that God created us to be. Because we can never serve Him completely when we constantly have these footholds that we're often giving to Satan because we go into areas we know we shouldn't be in. And so I invite you in this time of prayer and when we play the song of response to ask the Lord sincerely if there's any footholds, any snares, any traps, any hooks that maybe Satan has put in your life and ask the Lord to seek them out, to pull, and it's going to be painful. I've gone through this process myself. It's going to hurt. But in the end, you know that that hurt is going to lead to healing as the Lord covers your life and heals those broken areas and helps you to not get trapped anymore. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this vivid, let's just call it graphic passage. A lot of things Paul just needed to say to the church in Ephesus. And Lord, we needed to hear it today. Lord, we, we participate in conversations we should We go to things that we shouldn't. And because of that, we give Satan a foothold in our lives that works to destroy the church. Lord, help us to remove those hooks. Help us to, to recognize that we shouldn't go into areas to put new hooks in. But most of all, Lord, grant us a heart of repentance to turn away from those wicked things so that we can fully serve you as a workman, a workwoman that is not ashamed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.